This is Friday, September 19, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Jennifer Holy. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Nice to be here. May I ask when you were born? April 5, 1972. And where were you born? Denver, Colorado. And what town do you currently live in? Williamstown, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? I have a four-year-old little boy. Tell us a bit about your childhood. Uh, I moved around a lot. Um, my parents were married very young, in their tw early 20s, and um, they had children very fast, so we moved a lot at first because of just them being hippies, and then my dad had a sales job, so he moved a lot for that. Um, I had kind of a lot of um, tumultuous times because of all that, mm -hmm. and so it was a little bit chaotic, and um, it was, there was a lot of intensity mm -hmm. going on, so that's one of the biggest things that attracted me to the Army. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wouldn't say it was the most peaceful childhood. <laughs> That's the kindest thing I can say about it. Okay. Uh, so where and when did you enter the military? I was, had moved to Texas eventually when I was 15, spent high school there, and uh, at 18 I started looking for a way to go to college. And I had no money, they had no money saved up for college, so I had a lady who told me about an Army ROTC scholarship and I thought, did she just say army? <laughs> and I had no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought they were camouflage and stuff on their faces. And I was a cheerleader, and so I didn't think mm -hmm. it was for me. And um, they said you would have a year for free um, before you signed on the dotted line. And nursing was in a shortage, and so the Army Nurse Corps needed people. And I'd wanted to be a doctor at first, but I thought, you know, I'll go and see how it is. And um, my first FTX, which was a field training exercise, I was pretty much hooked. Um, I knew I was mm -hmm. in the right place with the right people. And many mm -hmm. of them are still my family today, so. Okay, and you were at uh, TCU, which mm -hmm. is Texas Christian University. Yep. Mm -hmm. You have the color shirt on, they're purple, yes. Mm -hmm. In Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. And uh, were you in ROTC? for four years. I had a four-year scholarship and um, it's pretty intense. You have to do all the nursing requirements plus the ROTC requirements and our school was a very good ROTC program. It was accredited, nationally known, um, mm -hmm. very, very motivating and it was very good for me. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more about ROTC. Uh, it's the Reserve Officer Training Corps and um, basically you know they train you to be an officer and you go in and many schools like Texas A&M and TCU, they treat you like enlisted uh, for quite a bit because they want you to know what that's like because you're going to be leading mm -hmm. enlisted people later on. So you, most of it, ROTC is geared for a thing called advance camp, which is our junior year, the summer after our junior year. So that is pretty much the focus for the first three years. Um, you do all kinds of things, field training exercises, um, obstacle courses, physical fitness, um, marching, drilling, you know, it's, we had labs every Thursday for two hours and uh, they just, they taught you everything. I mean, everything about the Army and manuals inside and out and um, it was a completely new world for me. And from my freshman year on, I knew that it was what I needed. What year did you graduate from TCU? Um, June 1994. And were you commissioned? I was. I was commissioned. Um, I had done very well at advanced camp uh, that summer in Tacoma, Washington, which was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And so I did uh, very well. I was number one on the order merit list. And um, so I got married to another officer. But if I hadn't gotten married, I would have probably gone to e Egypt or someplace like that. So. Uh, yes, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Tell us a little bit about the Army in those days. It's right after the Cold War, mm -hmm. before the War on Terror. Uh, give us a, your thoughts on that period. It was interesting because I went to El Paso. My ex-husband was going to El Paso first, so um, we went to William Beaumont Army Medical Center together at Fort Bliss. Pretty big medical center. 
and um, it was on the border right there in El Paso. So that had its own dynamics. And, um, you know, nurses have always been in a shortage and that year especially. So uh, you go to OBC first before you get stationed at Officer Basic Course. And, um, you know, there was a lot of talk of, you know, always the unrest in the Middle East was still going on. Mm -hmm. And then within that first year of me being at El Paso, um, that's when Aristide had the coup and um, the United Nations as a part of Uphold Democracy um, went over there to have mm -hmm. a fair election mm -hmm. of the next president. And so that was the big thing going on for when I was there. And Aristide was, of course, president of Haiti. Exactly. Right. So this was all going on in Haiti. So we got the word early in 95 uh, that the 131st Field Hospital, which was connected to William Beaumont, would be going. And my ex-husband was S3, which is the operations officer, so he knew he was going. And then they needed doctors and nurses, and I was very stoked. So I had um, my head nurse of the medical, I was on the medical surgical ward, um, 9 East for the first year, and she had recommended me to be deployed. When did you go to Haiti? In October of 95. And was this um, the first time you've been overseas? Uh, not the first time I've been overseas, but one of, I mean, I've been to Mexico and um, the Bahamas and stuff like that, but this was the first time ever to go to a third world country and the first time to go to anything of this nature. What had you been told about Haiti? Um, pretty stereotypical, very impoverished, um, very, you know, devastating conditions. I knew a lot about the voodoo that they had practiced, um, and I did some research and stuff. I knew it was going to be really hot, <laughs> mm. and um, I had a, a vision in my mind of some of the conditions, but it was nothing like what it was. I had no idea. What part of Haiti were you stationed? We were in Port-au-Prince. Uh, the, they put you in a huge compound, and the DEPMED, which is the deployable medical unit, which is really cool. It's literally a blow-up hospital and the ISO shelters come off of that, that is the whole hospital. It has an ER, ICU, ward, and then these fold-out uh, shelters come out of this big thing and they connect to this hospital and that's the laboratory, the x-ray, and the OR. It's a fully functional, totally deployable mm -hmm. hospital. It's really cool. Was that hospital there to treat just military personnel or everybody? It was there to treat the United Nations uh, soldiers, so that was Bangladeshis, you know, French, whoever was there, and only if we hurt the Haitians. If, uh, for example, two boys went on a United Nations truck to steal the garbage and they got hurt and they came into our emergency room. So yes, we had to treat them if they were somehow injured in, um, by the United Nations indirectly or whatsoever. And what rank were you at the time? Were you still a second? I was still a second lieutenant. I made first lieutenant while I was over there. And what, what were your duties? I was an ER nurse. There was only two of us, um, two second lieutenants for a full 24-hour uh, shift, seven days a week. It was literally 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And it was very controversial because the Army Nurse Corps is an interesting thing. Um, I wrote about this before. They just kind of say, you suck it up and do it. But it was really hard because we were only two. And I mean, we were busy. We had traumas. And then a lot of like the administrative people if anybody had a heart attack or chest pain or any colds or anything like that, they would come see us too. So it was typical emergency room plus some very significant traumas would come in. You mentioned about the two boys stealing garbage off a truck. Were, um, do you recall any other incidents while you were on duty? With the Haitians? With anybody. Oh, there's yeah, quite a bit. Um, the first day I was there, it was actually, I think the second day, it was the first week I was there. and. Uh, one of the military police had asked um, if I wanted to go see Port-au-Prince. And one of our duties was going to be to liaison with the Children's Hospital in Port-au-Prince. And I thought that we were going to do something really cool with them, like maybe clean up their stuff, their facility or help them in some way. But uh, he took us there, me and another lieutenant, and uh, basically very political thing. We were just painting a wall to make it look better. And so it was definitely a political move that I mean, when I walked into this children's hospital, there was probably 60 children in one ward. 
very cramped, very um, debilitating conditions, very nice people. They, you know, were taking good care of them to the best of their abilities, but it was nothing like I had seen in American hospitals, of course. And so um, actually when we left there, um, we got back in the United Nations truck and this lady was coming towards us. And we had already been warned, you know, we're not there to treat the Haitians. Second of all, um, they believed in corporal punishment, definitely a voodoo type of every eye for an eye. And she had a huge gash over her head. And a lot of them had warned us they use machetes for vigilante type of justice. So she was walking with this huge gash in her head and there was a soldier back with me and um, the other lieutenant and then there was a mili military police officer driving. And it was one of those kind of fundamental moments in your life where you're like, you knew this lady needed assistance, uh, clearly was a Haitian. And um, so the military police officer was like, we're just gonna stop, we're gonna bandage her head and we're gonna get back in the truck. And this is downtown Port-au-Prince and there's only four of us. So um, the other lieutenant and I quickly grabbed our first aid kits and those were back in the days when you still um, did it regulation style but you did your sleeves up and so that you could tolerate the heat because it was extremely hot there, very mm -hmm. humid. So we got out, we kind of surrounded her, started wrapping her head. Um, it's very hard to dress a head wound and all of a sudden the military police officer said get back in the truck, get back in the truck right now and they were swarming and the Haitians, I describe it as there was one thing that was not like the other. There was three men and one woman and I was the woman and they were swarming around me. So that um, military police officer took out his nine millimeter and had it out and told everybody to get back and within 20 seconds we were back in that truck. But interestingly enough, as we were dressing her wounds, um, some blood fell off and landed on the other lieutenant's arm and it's very high HIV down there. So he started definitely um, becoming very uncomfortable. And it was just so surreal because it happened very fast. And I just always remember that military police officer because he was so decisive, he was so in control, and he's the one that definitely saved our lives. I don't know what they would have done, I can't speculate, but they definitely, there was a lot of people swarming quickly. And um, it was an ethical thing. We definitely did bandage her head, but I mean, obviously we would have gotten in a lot of trouble for stopping if we thought about it, you know, in too much depth. Yeah, so that's wow. one of the greatest stories. And then one day I was running PT around the um, compound. It was hot because we still had to take PT tests. And you know, it's two miles and then push-ups and sit-ups. And uh, I was about to go into the debt med to get some water and some air conditioning because I was going to be on shift in a couple hours and a United Nations truck came up and these Bangladeshi men were screaming at the top of their lungs and one of their comrades and they didn't speak very much English they were trying to tell me and I look over and this man's intestines are literally hanging out he had gotten hit high speed by a truck and uh, so I said wait a minute grab my gloves rushed inside and got a litter got three medics we rushed out and we put him on the litter and I knew, you know, he was very young, but I knew from the nature of the wound. Um, but we rushed him to the OR, which is that little ISO shelter. And to be quite honest, even though you, it was sterilized every day and it was cleaned and everything, there was still mosquitoes in there. I mean, it was no way. The field conditions coming from America and, you know, ORs are so sterile and there's like certain pressure. This was out in the field, I mean, so. It was impossible to keep it um, completely clean, and he, he did die, um, unfortunately. So at any minute, that was how it was. I mean, there was just so much going on. Mm -hmm. And how long were you stationed in Haiti? Six months, from October to April of 96. Aside from emergency situations, did you ever have a chance to interact with the local Haitians? We did. Um, they are very um, amazing at sculptures and woodwork, very, very talented. And that's one of their major ways of um, making money in their commerce. And I still have a trunk and I actually have a lot of statues that they made. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful culture. It really is. There's a lot to it. Uh, it's a very impoverished culture, obviously. And I remember one of the first times we were there when I saw the water source they used in the main city they used it for their drinking, for their washing, for their cooking, for their everything. And 
you know, you just, it was very perspective changing um, of your life. And I, my marriage was crumbling at the time and I, it helped me immensely um, to just kind of keep my problems in perspective because I didn't compare to what they were going through. It was a very humbling experience. You know, my my church has an active relation with one of the uh, one of the churches down in Haiti, and we do get regular updates. Yeah, I really liked it there. Mm -hmm. I did. I would love to do some missionary work there again. Anything else from your experiences down there? Yeah, we were there for when the actual election happened, mm -hmm. and there was three of us, three units. Um, I was with a surgeon. I was the nurse. There was a medic. And an ambulance driver, and uh, when Perval was Rene Perval was the one who was elected, mm -hmm. he the formality was that Aristide was going to hand off the reins to him. However, and so they went from um, Parliament to the church to the palace, and it was like a convoy of mm -hmm. all three events for their inauguration. And uh, I was at the first. Uh, at the Parliament, so I actually saw it. I was right outside when I saw um, Rene Preval give his acceptance speech, and then we kind of followed th that whole convoy, and we were there to make sure, you know, especially our armored cab guys, people that were providing protection to make sure there was no, it was a very controversial election, so they were ready for protests, stuff like that. They were working with the Haitian police um, to try to make sure, you know, nothing um, erupted, I guess, in, in protests. And um, so then from the parliament, we went to the church, uh, one of the main churches, and that's where he was blessed by the priest. And then we went to the palace and we just waited. And um, the palace was where they had the celebration for his inauguration. So that was very cool. I mean, that I'll never mm -hmm. forget. Mm -hmm. But you do, you know, the, the pomp and circumstance of this, all of this convoy and all the stuff that was going on in this palace and then this nation in complete poverty you know, you're hoping the whole time that this election will come to fruition and that these people will do right for their people mm -hmm. and help pull them out because it, it was a democracy and you're hoping that he mm -hmm. was properly elected. In general, do you feel that you had uh, proper clothing, proper equipment? Yeah, I, I mean, the United States Army is state of the art and, um, you know, I, it was the best time of my life from mm -hmm. ROTC on it. Um, taught me a lot, and I always felt protected. I always mm -hmm. felt like, you know, the debt med is very current, very, you know, a state of the art medicine. I think it's always current. How about you, how about the leadership? Um, do you want me to be honest? <laughs> mm -hmm. I have some problems with the Army Nurse Corps. I will be completely honest. I, um, you know, in ROTC, I was led by a lot of you know, officers who were going to many different branches, well, not branches, but MOSs. So you had a lot of infantry guys who are still in, they're friends, I'm friends with them now, they're lieutenant colonels. Um, a lot of guys had been to Afghanistan, I, ra I trained with all these guys. And it, we had quite a big nurse corps too, going in from ROTC. But, um, you know, so I was trained in, in the same type of corps as these guys, and, you know, you knew that it was gonna be hard you knew that advanced camp was very hard. It was almost impossible um, because you have to not only lead, but you have to be able to follow. There's lots of stuff to it, but you knew there was a m meaning to that mission and there was a method and it was like, no matter how hard it got, it made sense. In the Army Nurse Corps, it's a lot like civilian nursing in my opinion, that there's this insidiousness that says, this is the way it's always been. You like it or you get out kind of thing. and. Things that could be, for example, when we did that emergency room shift, there's two second lieutenants. Well, there was four OR nurses that were just on call. So I came up with a solution. Can we borrow one of them, just one shift a week, so the other lieutenant and I could even have just a break? No, 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 this mm -hmm. is the way it is. So just common sense stuff like that and ways to keep people happy. Um, and I kept running into that uh, my whole Army Nurse Corps career, and I can't say, you know, obviously there was many good things about it, but also, you know, a lot of my commanders couldn't pass their PT tests, they couldn't make tape, you know, so it was very discouraging, and, and I mean, I have friends now that are still in that are complete studs, so it's not the entire Nurse Corps, but it is what I experienced, and it was very frustrating, yeah. uh, because nursing itself is an extremely hard profession by the nature of what we do. So if you've heard the expression, nurses eat their young, 
that is very much what I saw in many places, and it was very um, hard to try to rise above that, mm -hmm. to be honest. You mentioned that you were basically 12 hours on, 12 hours off, seven days a week. Did you ever have a chance to have some recreation? Well, we had an um, administrative head nurse. He was a captain, mm -hmm. and he was administrative only, so I don't really know why that. But every two weeks or so, he would give us a break. And, um, yeah, we got – but the other lieutenant and I were just very proactive people. I mean, we – scheduled an Olympics for the whole unit for morale. I mean, I taught aerobics the whole time I was there. I mean, I was 22 years old and just highly motivated. So, I mean, we made the best out of it, tried to lead by example, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Any other um, incidents, uh, characters that you remember from your time in Haiti? I met one of the finest female surgeons I've ever known in, in my career. I mean, I've been in nursing for 21 years, and she was just amazing. She, um, you know, it's very hard to be a surgeon in, in the Army, to be a female surgeon back in the 90s, even in the 90s. You know, you think that you had progressed, but it, she was amazing, and she would take the kind of, you know, sexual harassment that, I mean, it's, it's there. And it was especially there. I think that was way before the time where a lot of, I don't know what they call it now, sensitivity tra sensitivity training had happened. And she just, she was just amazing. She was a good doctor, and uh, she seemed to always rise above it. Was a great mentor for the females mm -hmm. in our unit because it was a pretty big unit, um, the entire field hospital. So she definitely made an impact on my life. And the co-lieutenant I was with, complete stud. She mm -hmm. and I just completely bonded those six months. Or we had hooches. That's where you slept. And uh, <laughs> when we first got there, we got briefed on the mosquitoes. Very significant. You had to sleep under a mosquito net that was this close to your cot. Wear DEET all the time after you got out of the shower, which can take off your nail polish. Uh, well, we didn't wear nail polish, but it could take off your skin. Uh, so very powerful stuff. And um, so you had a cold shower, <laughs> which was nice when it was hot. But then you had to put DEET all over you. And then not only did they warn you about the mosquitoes, but there's this very uh, interesting entity in Haitian called the Haitian rat <laughs> that um, they had warned us about. And I remember this other lieutenant and I walking, we we're getting oriented to our hooch, and they kept telling you, do not bring food, do not bring food in there, do not bring food in there. And we were talking, and we're like, well, how bad can it be, you know? And we saw this thing go into one of the hooches because the plywood would only come up to here. So you could see people's feet. I mean, the privacy, you know, it was very intimate quarters. Mm -hmm. And I said, look at that cat. And she, she was like, that's a big cat. And this captain behind me said, that's no cat, soldier. And I was like, literally, I mean, the tail was that long. So, you know, it's a very much like a sewer rat where they kind of get as big as they can eat. And it was terrifying. And I guess I'd heard, he told me a story while we were walking of an armored cab guy that had toothpaste on his chin, and this rat started chewing on it when he was out in the field, and he pretty much lost it. They had to send him home on psych leave because they were so significant. Um, it was very hard to keep them out of your quarters, even if you didn't have food. So that was another psychological kind of thing that... Um, for six months, it doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're there every day, pretty much every major holiday, you know, you're, you're knowing your family's at home, and, and then you have to deal with these rats and mosquitoes. It was, <laughs> it was trying. Okay. Well, after six months in Haiti, what happened next? Well, that C-130 ride was probably the best ride of my life. When we came back, they had a huge celebration in El Paso, and I honestly, to sound completely corny, when that Star Spangled Banner went, I was bawling my eyes out. Very significant. It's one of, obviously, the most monumental times of my life. You, you know you served your country. Uh, you know that you had, it was a hardship rotation and uh, even got hazard pay because at the end, the Haitians would kind of try to get over the compound at night pretty much to just steal things because they were poor, not really to hurt us. But, you know, there was, there was quite a bit going on. So coming home, you knew what you had been missing. You realized, you know, food tasted different, the air smells different, the heat is definitely different, even as I was going back to Texas because El Paso is dry. Mm -hmm. And Haiti, Port-au-Prince especially, is very humid. I mean, like blanket humid, mm -hmm. uh, even in October. So, you know, everything was different. It was um, a very life-changing event. Mm -hmm. 
And I went back, I went immediately into the emergency room and, and trauma because I had done it for in Haiti. And, um, you know, it was a lot of stuff going on. We treated a lot of Mexicans who came over uh, the Rio Grande, which that still was a problem, you know, the border control. And, you know, these people are trying to get over this country and you kind of treat them and send them back. And it's, you know, gut-wrenching. It really is. They get hurt on the fence or whatever. Um, they swim in the Rio Grande. <laughs> They're all wet. Yeah, so it's just, it's a, definitely a border town. Mm -hmm. And you were still in the Army? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm I went from, until 98. I stayed the entire time. The only break I had from Fort Bliss was Haiti. What else do you remember about your time in Fort Bliss? Another phenomenal, probably the best head nurse I've ever had. Um, he was Lieutenant Colonel. He was my emergency room head nurse. And if I could clone him, I would. Um, he made probably the most significant professional impre impression on my life. He didn't just mentor you. He was right beside you. Like he, there was no such thing as nurses eat their young with him. He just molded us all, and he made sure we had breaks, he made sure we went to the bathroom, he led by example, he showed us things, he never expected too much from us, because you're already doing, you know, when you've got people dying and, you know, trauma, that psychologically gets you, but then physically you're exhausted, and he just knew how to take care of his nurses, and because of that, you knew you could do it, and I think that kind of thing, um, post-traumatic stress disorder is very significant, for nurses and I think it's very undertreated and especially like he would have debriefings you know how did you feel during this what you know because it's very you know you've seen children die ch ch children abuse um, traumas drunk drivers everything just mm -hmm. senseless very hard things to deal with and he always made sure that we were okay and the other thing he would do is no doctor ever abused us when he was around he you know, the thing that's interesting about the Army and that's not in the civilian world is nurses can outrank doctors. And he not only outranked many of, you know, it was a resident program, so a lot of these doctor residents were like maybe first lieutenant captains. He's a lieutenant colonel. But he never had to pull rank. He was so, everybody respected him so much because of his caliber and what he knew as a nurse, how he, you know, just projected himself. He was amazing. He was an amazing human being. I miss him dearly. I really do. Yeah. Uh, do you have a name? I do. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Hartman. He was an amazing, amazing man. I changed him in my books. I don't remember his real name. <laughs> I changed everybody's <laughs> name in my book. But no, he was instrumental. And then I had a friend who I had been in OBC with, and she was um, on Nine West when I was on Nine East. And then when I went to Haiti, I came back, and we were ER nurses together. And mm -hmm. she also... Uh, her name is Jennifer Gerdman. Now she's Jennifer Bathazar. Phenomenal nurse. Just amazing. I just wish that mm -hmm. we could have them everywhere. It makes life easier when you have such great people with you. So now we're about 1998, and you decided to leave active service? That was a lot to do with my marriage. I was mm -hmm. married to a medical service guy, and uh, he was trying to get into be a medevac pilot, and he didn't make it, so he wanted to go on to grad school. And I um, had a big decision to make, and we were married, and so um, we both decided as a couple to get out and go back to graduate school. And where did you go to graduate school? I started off at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I went on to be a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. But you remained in the Army as an inactive reserve. Yeah, it's real easy. You just kind of sign paper. It's not active reserve. You don't have to go to drill or anything. Mm -hmm. And what was your rank at the time you left active? <clears throat> Excuse me. I had made captain uh, for about two months. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I made it. I mean, I did. Yeah. I am an 03, so mm -hmm. if I ever wanted to go back in, it would be as an 03. So you became a nurse practitioner. Tell us what happened next. Oh, that's a long story. Uh, we ended up getting a divorce for a lot of reasons, and I left Missouri a uh, year into it and um, was a very hard decision. But my family was all back in Texas, and his family was all up in Missouri. So right before I started my clinicals, I had not completed 
um, grad school yet, so I wasn't technically a nurse practitioner yet. Mm -hmm. So I went back, and that same Jennifer that I had known um, in the Army, she was working at Parkland in, T in Dallas, and so I got a job there. And I took a year off and did trauma there, very intense county hospital. And then I went back to school at the University of Texas in Arlington. And that's where I finished my first master's. I have mm -hmm. two. As a nurse practitioner, uh, I did a family nurse practitioner. Tell us what happened next. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, uh, it's a long story. Um, so then I met somebody at Parkland mm -hmm. who was a surgeon, and uh, we kind of started dating. And um, but I was a nurse practitioner um, at the time, and I actually did telemedicine, which is fascinating. Telemedicine is how my first job as a nurse practitioner, and in Texas, especially in the rural parts, to answer their lack of providers. They take a nurse practitioner who travels. I traveled a lot, almost all over the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. They have a satellite and a huge television in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. The doctor is literally in Houston. You have this camera on this television. You wheel it around from room to room. And obviously somebody with my experience with all the ER stuff was why they hired me. Um, because you run the show and you present every patient to the doctor in Houston. So if you have a problem, you literally say, Houston, we have a problem, <laughs> as cheesy as that is. And you run the codes, you suture, splint, everything. And any given shift, um, there's three uh, hospitals that he or she in Houston is overseeing. And there is a backup doctor who is usually like a family practice or somebody like that who's on call. Um, so it's a 24-hour shift. It's fascinating. Um, and it worked really well because I, you know, delivered babies. I had to medevac people out of there. I mean, it was like, if you think about the military, it was like that battalion aid station, that first aid station where your triage skills are what comes into, like, you got to know, is this appropriate for me to treat here or do I need to get this person out of here? So the ambulance, a lot of times, especially for women, women don't present with the same type of symptoms of heart attack. You know, there's a lot of things that are, are different and you just got to know when you're supposed to send them on because these hospitals are just little hospitals. They have doctors there, but they're not appropriate for any type of, you know, trauma or uh, heart attacks or stuff like that. So all of them have helicopters and if you need to, you, you send them out by helicopter. So great experience. And how long you were, you were you in that? I did that for three years. Three years. So that pretty much brings us to the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I, um, that, that company did telemedicine, but also ER, traditional ER sites where you work side by side by a doctor. So I did a lot of ER work, um, a lot of fast track, which is the, you know, primary care kind of thing. But then I worked one-on-one with, -on -one with the doctor and did a ton of stuff with strokes and heart attacks and mm -hmm. trauma. Just an, a very phenomenal time in my career. Mm -hmm. And I ended up marrying the surgeon. Um, <laughs> and we left to go to California for a while in 03. To, um, he was doing a fellowship in plastic surgery. Now, you were still on inactive reserve in the Army uh, oh, two. Oh, two. Yes. And tell us about September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. That's interesting for me because I had stayed, my sister turned 30 in um, 2000, and I took them all out there, and we actually stayed at the World Trade Center. And we stayed in the Marriott Hotel, which was located there. And there's three things that I remember. This was the year before, and it was October, so it was almost it was 11 months. I remember thinking how much glass there was in this place. I could not believe how much glass. I couldn't believe how many people there were at any given time. And there were subways that ran underneath of it. So, um, and it was just the hub. You know, it was such a hub of activity for Manhattan. And um, I can't say concretely what would ever happen if something happened to this place, but you do kind of structurally and architecturally think this place is completely full of glass because it's what it is. And we had a beautiful time there. It was a, it's a gorgeous, um, you know, gorgeous part of Manhattan. And then I was actually in 01, when it happened, I was just finishing my nurse practitioner clinicals. 
because I worked at Parkland while I was doing clinicals. Mm -hmm. And I had just gotten off a shift and I was coming into my mother's because she was right next to, she happened to be next to um, the place I was doing clinicals. And I saw the second plane going in and my sisters were watching and I'm like, what is this? What's going on? And they're like, we don't know if this is real. That's what they kept saying. This, this seems like it's real, but we don't know what's happening. And then we saw it go into the second tower. And it was just, I mean, mm -hmm. how do you describe it? And I remember thinking, mm -hmm. as it was happening, we watched all of the day's events, how you know, crowded and how hard it would be to get ambulances, especially as the trauma nurse that I am, firefighters and everything, mm -hmm. even to manipulate and maneuver through that kind of traffic and through that kind of chaos. And from my brief time in Manhattan, I just knew, because New Yorkers are special, they're so special, and it's like, I knew that it was how, how can we help, how can we bond, how we can, you know, because it's a true melting pot. So I just remember watching and I was just in awe of every firefighter that I saw, I didn't even hesitate going into the buildings, you know, and as a trauma nurse, I know what it's like, even from that time in Haiti, when the adrenaline and you're trained to do something, you do it. And it was just a phenomenal thing to watch. In the immediate aftermath, did you have a thought in the back of your mind that you were going to be called? Yeah, you know, I the whole time in the four years that I was in active reserves, I thought about that for sure. And, you know, what were we going to do with the war on terror and um, the axis of evil and all that stuff that was going on. And, um, yeah, it definitely crossed my mind. And I was still highly deployable, you know, mm -hmm. at that time, especially with my MOS and experience in trauma as a nurse. All right, you are now in, you are in California in 2003. Mm -hmm. How'd you come to Massachusetts? Well, yeah, we, um, long story, that marriage didn't work out either. And um, so that's when I went to anesthesia school. And I had thought about anesthesia school from the Army, actually, and being a nurse anesthetist. And when I was all the way back at advanced camp that I told you about at the beginning, mm -hmm. I followed a nurse anesthetist, and she blew me away. She was amazing. And because of the devastation of my second divorce, um, it was a very personal, very hard time. I remember thinking I need something here to pull me out. And my career had always helped me. And so I um, went to anesthesia school at TCU. So I got back because I TCU was my home. TCU, and I liked UTA, I did. Um, but TCU, there's something about it. It's just, that's where ROTC just gave me the direction I needed. So it was kind of like a parallel thing again after my divorce. And it was a great program. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And um, I became a nurse anesthetist. And then a job brought me up to Massachusetts. So here you are, basically a Southern girl, and you're in the middle of Yankee land. I am. But you know, I think really my subconscious from those p moments in Manhattan and from all of this stuff now as a mother I really am drawn up here I love it up here I think very highly of East Coast people I, I think that you guys get a bit of a bad rap um, from other places <laughs> that you're cold somehow and I don't see that at all mm -hmm. um, it's beautiful here I mean I right mm -hmm. now am so close to Boston I've taken my son many times to Boston love Boston and I love Manhattan and I love the Berkshires. I mean, that's where we're, and there's so many things for him to do. And, uh, and I'm writing right now, you know, I'm doing a lot of writing about my story and all of these things that we were just discussing. So tell us about the book that you, uh, you. you published. Yes, I self-published through Manchester, mm -hmm. Vermont and Northshire Books, and they've been awesome. And uh, it's called Cinderella. The church mm -hmm. and a crazy lady, <laughs> and okay. I'm the crazy lady. Um, and just you know, it's it's my life story with a mm -hmm. lot of influences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Cinderella, the church and a crazy lady. This is my little bookmark. But you can get it on Northshire.com. If you just even look up Jenna, uh, Jenna Hill is my pen name, or type in Cinderella, it will come up. And I'm very proud of it. I really am. I uh, my husband and I did it together. My current husband, mm -hmm. number three, mm -hmm. and. Um, my niece did the graphics and it just a complete labor of love and it's actually two parts because the army part is such a big part of my life that it took most of the first book being a cadet being an officer 
everything I learned and then I'm working on the second portion is is written I'm editing it and stuff mm -hmm. and so um, there's a great movement the Berkshire Festival Women Writers and it's just a very artistic community um, here and in, in Western Massachusetts and it's doing well so I'm very proud of that and what are you doing these days aside from writing taking care of my baby and mm -hmm. I actually took a break from nursing um, I had a lot of stuff that mental health wise um, quite frankly I had a nervous breakdown because my father died and um, died very traumatically of aggressive lymphoma and a lot of things happened that I just I think accumulation of everything mm -hmm. lots of years of trauma both professionally and personally and so I took a break and working on wellness and my sanity and now I'm doing coffee I am. I'm a barista and I actually really like it. And because I work from 5.30 to 11 and then I write afterwards. And mm -hmm. I'm there for my baby when he gets out of school. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like a slow down, take a deep breath, a little bit of a midlife crisis thing because I'm 42 now. But <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just kind of reflecting on the last, mm -hmm. especially 20 years. And because uh, life goes by very fast. Now, did you join any veterans organizations? Mm -hmm. I'm part of the Massachusetts Women's Veterans. That's where I seen, saw you at that event. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to the stand down in, um, where was that in Boston? It wasn't in Boston. Just, there was a stand down a couple months ago. Anyway, they're very active here. I'm mm -hmm. so impressed with Massachusetts. I just, I, it's called the Commonwealth for a reason. And I'm very into health promotion, obviously, for my nurse practitioner mm -hmm. roots. And, um, you know, I just, especially the mentally um, ill, mm -hmm. and I realize that as veterans, you know, there's one in 20 veterans commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, there's alarming statistics out there. And I don't think that we are doing all we can for the people who served our country. And, um, you know, politically, I'm a very political person. Um, I think morally, just a lot of things we could be doing. And um, so I'm excited because I think I'm excited. There's so much going on, especially for women veterans in this state. So, uh, yeah, I do a lot with them. Been to two of their um, conferences, and that's just a wealth of information. I mean, mm -hmm. every time I go, I'd like to get more involved with them. And I've talked to them about that. But next year, you know, maybe being a speaker or something like that, because, you know, give some of my experiences like I just did here. Mm -hmm. Overall, Jennifer, how important has it, was it for you to serve in the military? I think if I had not called that lady and she had told me about Army ROTC, um, quite honestly, I, it's hard to speculate, but I know I would not be, I would not have especially gone through the hard times in my life the way that I did if I had not had the Army. Mm -hmm. If I had not had the discipline and the the thing about the Army is, you know, there's other kind of tear you down, boot camp type of things, but that's so special about the United States Army is that they build you up and they truly believe in the team and they truly believe in the greater good. And they, it's just, it's hard to describe unless you're in it. You really are in a family. And like in October, I'm doing this 20th uh, reunion for all of our cadets and I've invited everybody not just the class of 94 but it, the Horn Frog Battalion like we're our family and those people when we train together and what we went through I mean you know that you can do it and then you know you can do it because you have your brothers and sisters next mm -hmm. to you and I'm honestly closer to them than I am my own family mm -hmm. um, and so that is pivotal to me it gave me roots it gave me a foundation and um, I think I would have been quite lost mm -hmm. without it. Jennifer, is there anything else you'd like to say? I just encourage women, um, really encourage them to, you know, I've gotten a lot of inquiries. Well, did you like it? Would you do it again? Absolutely, I would do it again. I, you know, part of my book is about how, as women, we're kind of damsel in distress, taught that somebody's going to come rescue us, and they're still teaching girls that to this day. And uh, my book is not a male bashing book. I love men. I really do, and I think that they have obviously their own ways that they were raised but I kind of think we're all in this together and the army for me was the most empowering thing I ever did and I think women need to be empowered mm -hmm. and I would recommend it for anyone and I think that you know where we're going gender wise like the rangers are about to open it up to females mm -hmm. which is amazing I mean I scored 300 on my PT tests 
and did just what the guys did. So gender should never hold you back. Um, I think that you know, if you set your mind to it, you can do anything. And it is harder for women in the military, definitely. There's still stereotypes, there's still stigmas. But if you do the work, um, I mean, as an organization, I believe they are for every individual. So mm -hmm. I, I really actually do miss it, and I loved it very much. Well, Jennifer Holy, we thank you so much thank for you. coming all the way from Williamstown. It was my pleasure. It was to, wonderful uh, to do this. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.